So for those of you who know anything about Marin Island will realize that this is not Marin Island in the picture here, but I start quite broadly by just, I think it's, um, you know, there's a certain appeal to islands um, that, that is in the popular psyche. Uh, and it goes back to um, you know, early publications like Robinson Crusoe, the idea of being stuck on a desert island, what record would you listen to for the rest of your life? Um, of course, not always happy thoughts about being stuck on islands, um, but for biologists, islands are really spectacularly interesting places. Um, both Darwin and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, the, the fathers of evolutionary theory, were heavily influenced by their experiences on islands. In the case of Darwin, largely the Galapagos, uh, Wallace in Wallachia, the, the islands between Southeast Asia and Australasia. And the reason why I think well, one of the many reasons why islands are so special for biologists is that we see evolution in action, basically. Um, we have these, particularly in the case of oceanic islands, these new bits of land that appear in the middle of the ocean and life arrives and adapts very quickly um, because you've got small founder populations, you've got very often severe, uh, strong selection forces. And we can see amazing examples of adaptive radiations, for example. So this is just one example. It's the Hawaiian honey creepers. Um, and it's just amazing what life can do when it gets to these little outposts of land in the middle of the ocean. Unfortunately, the, the very characteristics that make islands such amazing places for evolution to occur also makes them particularly susceptible to um, the impacts of humans arriving. And so in the case of the Hawaiian honey creepers, we only know a very small part of the story because a large proportion of the radiation is already extinct. And some of the, the stories behind those extinctions are really heartbreaking. I mean, the Pa'o Uli was only discovered in 1973 and barely 30 years later it was extinct despite fairly sterling efforts towards the end to try to conserve the last few individuals. Um, so there are these immensely interesting um, ecosystems, but also very fragile. Um, and another sort of really interesting example, the huia from New Zealand, the most sexually dimorphic bird of, that, that we know of, um, unfortunately went extinct in the 1800s. So we don't really understand why the males and the females were so extraordinarily different. And we can see um, the legacy of human colonization around the planet. Um, fully three quarters of terrestrial vertebrate extinctions in the last 500 years have been on islands and almost half of all critically endangered and endangered terrestrial vertebrates live on islands, even though we're having increasing impacts on, on continental systems. Um, we're still seeing this legacy of, of the human diaspora reaching every corner of the planet. And the main driver of those extinctions is as a result of invasive species. So 86% of the extinctions of vertebrates on islands have been driven by invasive species. So this is obviously a very depressing situation um, and it's an ongoing problem. So even now we have lots of islands with lots of invasive mammals, um, which are threatening very large numbers of, of animals. This is a paper that came out a couple of years ago trying to summarize and identify key islands for eradication. You can see there that the top invasive species is the cat followed by the black rat, dog, pig, etc. And you see the mouse doesn't even feature there, but we'll get there. But the good news about islands is although they are very vulnerable to invasive species, because they are small, we can actually uh, eradicate invasive species from islands and effectively turn back the clock. And this is what is really exciting about this. Most of the time in conservation these days, it kind of feels like we've got our finger in the dike and we, we're holding back the water, but it's kind of inevitable that eventually the crack is gonna large, enlarge and the water is gonna come through. But in the case of islands, we can actually turn back the clock entirely, reset the system um, by removing these invasive species, which are the major threat to the integrity of the ecosystem. And the really nice thing about this is that it's a, a one-off action. Once you eradicate, as long as you've got adequate biosecurity in place to stop reintroductions, we have this 
in perpetuity benefit. And we can see the benefits really quickly in some cases. So for example, um, South Georgia, which was a project that Keith Springer was intimately involved with, in, um, when rats and mice were eradicated from South Georgia, within a year or two, we could see rapid recovery of things like South Georgia pipits, South Georgia pintails, um, into areas where they were previously extirpated by rats. And when it comes to island invasions, some of the most successful invaders have been rodents. Um, so this is a sort of Southern Hemisphere view of the world for once, and all of the red dots are islands, um, and you don't really need to identify them as islands because the red dots indicate where the rodent introductions have occurred. So virtually every island in the world has had rodents introduced at some stage. And tonight we're going to be talking about Marion Island. For those of you who don't know where it is, it's roughly halfway between Africa and Antarctica in the middle of the Roaring Forties. And it's one of just a handful of sub-Antarctic islands, which are extremely important as breeding sites for species that require terrestrial um, breeding sites, but then feed in, in the aquatic systems. So things like seabirds and seals. Marion is administered by South Africa since 1947, it was annexed. And we have a research station. In fact, we have two research stations on Marion Island. On the right is the fancy new orange um, pumpkin base. And on the left is the old base, which was supposed to be removed once the new base was completed, but is still sitting there. And we're hoping that one of the spin-offs from the Mouse Free Marion project is that we'll hopefully get to restore that part of the island under the old base. But before I start talking about the mice, I think I'll just take you on a little bit of a tour of the island just to give you some sense of place, what we're talking about. Um, so Marion is the larger of the two Prince Edward Islands. Um, it's close to 300 square kilometers. Um, uh, and the smaller island in the group is Prince Edward Island, um, about a sixth of the size of Marion. The two islands are only 20 kilometers apart. They're both volcanic in origin, so they've never been connected to a continental landmass. And this is a sort of typical view looking across the landscape. You've got old black lava, uh, old gray lavas in the foreground, and then more recent black lavas flowing down across the um, coastal plains, and then red scoria hills dotting those coastal plains. It's quite a unique sort of landscape, um, very different from anything that you'll see certainly in Southern Africa. And it's still an active volcano. Um, this was a fairly recent flow in the last 20 years or so on the west coast of Marion. And it lies in the middle of the Roaring Forties, in fact, in perhaps the windiest section of the Roaring Forties in the middle of the Southern Ocean. Um, so it experiences very consistent and strong westerly winds typically, which creates these amazing cloud formations, lenticular clouds, and all sorts of really bizarre clouds at times around the island. Uh, a lot of the time the island is socked in in a low marine cloud layer um, with the peaks of the island sticking out above the clouds and this creates downstream uh, sort of ripple effect. So this is a satellite view of Marion and Prince Edward showing how the two islands uh, act as like a, a stick in a stream and create these ripples in the cloud layer extending for 100 kilometers downstream from the two islands. On a more calm day, you get these uh, much more pretty sort of uh, patterns, but you can see the, the wind eddying and carrying the clouds around the little vortices around the island, absolutely astounding. Because of the very high wind speeds, the vegetation is all low lying and there's no woody vegetation to speak of. Um, perhaps the most charismatic plant on the island is the Kaguelan cabbage, which was famous with early seafarers as a sort of vitamin C, C vitamin C, um, so the scientific name is Pringlia antiscorbuta, and so it was a cure for scurvy. And just as there are some endemic plants on the island, there's also a whole host of endemic invertebrates associated with Marion. Um, this is uh, the flightless moth, so it looks more like a cricket than a moth, but it's actually a moth um, and typical of oceanic islands that um, organisms often lose the power of flight once they're no longer threatened by terrestrial predators. Surrounding the islands is a fairly productive patch of ocean. Marion lies downstream from the Southwest Atlantic Ridge, which creates a series of eddies 
Um, and wherever you get eddy formation in the ocean, in oceanic waters, typically you're gonna get enhanced productivity. And then just the passage of water past the island creates upwelling because of the island mass effect. And so the waters around the island are relatively productive by Southern Ocean standards. Um, this is just some bull kelp growing along the shore of Marion. And as I said earlier, um, it's one of a handful of subantarctic islands in the area. And so it's extremely important for breeding populations of marine predators that have to return to shore to breed or molt. So this is a sort of typical coastal bay on Marion with um, sort of nose to tail elephant seals and king penguins, huge populations of breeding penguins. These are macaroni penguins in the foreground and then king penguins in the background at Kildalki Bay. And wherever you get such high concentrations of marine predators, um, you're going to get even larger predators feeding on them. So there's a killer whale population that's been quite intensively studied over the last decade or so by the University of Pretoria team. Um, from a birding perspective, I think to me, the iconic bird of the island is the wandering albatross. Um, this is obviously famous as the bird with the largest wingspan of any bird in the world. Um, it gets its name because it travels very large distances at sea. Uh, we've tracked one male around the ocean three times during its sabbatical year off between breeding attempts. Most individuals don't do this um, very wide ranging behavior. Most of them remain in one or two ocean basins, but some males in particular go right around the Southern Ocean. So they're living up to their name as wandering albatrosses. And as is characteristic of most seabirds, they have very conservative life histories. They raise at most one chick every two years. Um, and those chicks take at least eight years really before they recruit to the breeding population. And this means that basically they are very susceptible to additional mortality. And unfortunately, over the last 30 or so years, um, we've known that there's been a significant problem with albatross bycatch on longline fishes. Um, the Albatross Task Force has worked assiduously. It's a project run by BirdLife International um, with a very strong branch in South Africa. And this problem, uh, fortunately, is getting better in many parts of the world, I'm pleased to say. Um, but because we can track these populations very closely, this is some data from South Georgia showing how the wandering albatross on South Georgia has population on Bird Island has changed over the last um, 50 years or so. And you can see uh, it, it's a, not a very pretty story. It's been a steady decrease with a faster decrease from 1995 to about 2008. In stark contrast to that at Marion, much healthier situation. And this is typical of the Southwest Indian Ocean population of wandering albatrosses. And it's now reached a point where the Prince Edward Islands collectively are home to almost half of all wandering albatrosses. So we have this major obligation to ensure the future of this iconic seabird. And it's not just wandering albatrosses that breed on Marion. There are three other albatross species. Um, Marion alone is home to 12% of the world population of sooty albatrosses, which are listed as endangered globally. Um, fortunately at Marion, their population has been relatively stable. Grey-headed albatrosses, 7% um, of the world population breeds on Marion, and there's um, small numbers of light-mantled albatrosses as well. And then a whole host of other seabirds, I'm not going to go through the whole litany, but 20 other species of seabirds breed on the island. So it's a really important location for um, birds and seals, and then of course all the terrestrial biota that's endemic to the island. So now we come to the villain of the piece, a rather innocuous looking fellow really, a house mice, um, and it's a super tramp species which has traveled to islands all over the world in association with humans. We don't know exactly when it arrived on Marion, we think it was around about 1800, perhaps late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, coming with sealers who uh, visited the island to exploit uh, seals and penguins to a lesser extent. And after South Africa annexed the island, um, a weather station was established uh, and the people in the weather station didn't like having mice running around, so they took a few cats down. And unfortunately, the cats were not all of the same sex, so all the five cats soon created kittens. And fast forward a few years, um, barely 20 years later, we had 2,000 cats on the island, killing close to half a million petrels every year. 
So yes, they were killing mice, but they were also having a massive impact on the seabird population. They were particularly problematic for winter breeding species like the gray petrel and the great winged petrel because there was few other feeding opportunities for cats in winter. So the two species that bred through the heart of winter were particularly hard hit by the cats. But species breeding year round obviously were, were targeted. And in the case of the common diving petrel and some of the storm petrels, they were actually driven to local extinction by cat predation. Fortunately, uh, Martin Best uh, um, led uh, an eradication attempt to remove cats from the island. This was back in the day when it was still possible to do this kind of thing before public opinion was um, would have got in the way. Perhaps if you said you were going to go to shoot 2,000 cats, you'd probably have an outcry these days. Um, so initially, uh, fe feline uh, influenza panleukopenia was introduced to the cat population on the island that halved the population. And then um, hunting, but with shotguns at night was introduced. And then finally, um, various trapping and baiting techniques were used to catch the last few individuals. And after a very sustained effort lasting more than a decade, the last cat was eradicated sometime around about 1990. And Marion Island remains the largest island in the world to have cats removed from it. And I think that's it's a largely unsung achievement of South African conservation effort over the last um, sort of 30 or 40 years or so. And most of the credit for that must go to Martin Bester from the University of Pretoria, um, if only for motivating people to go out at night in atrocious conditions to go and shoot cats. And so in the 1990s, we thought everything was nice and jolly on Marion. We got rid of the cats and the seabird populations would start to recover. Um, but the next phase of our story is over in the Atlantic Ocean, where we can go to Gough Island. Um, so Gough was renowned as being perhaps the single most important island for breeding seabirds in the world. It was one of only two temperate islands in the South Atlantic Ocean. It lies a few hundred kilometers southeast of Tristan de Cunha, um, uninhabited apart from a South African weather station, and just a most amazing place um, for, for seabirds. And so it's home to um, virtually all the population of Tristan albatrosses, virtually all the Atlantic petrels in the world breed there, most of the Megillibrees prions breed on the island, and just a for somebody who's into birds, it's just the most amazing place, or it certainly was when I was fortunate to go there and rob um, in that sort of in that early 1980s, it was insane to go there. But the first ornithologist to spend a year on the island, Richard Cuthbert, in 2000, was surprised to find large numbers of uh, the Tristan albatross chicks dying mysteriously when they were large like this and uh, really unusual large albatross chicks like this shouldn't just keel over and die and they very rapidly get stripped clean by giant petrels and skewers so it wasn't easy to see what had happened but the only thing that Richard could think was that somehow the mice were killing these birds which outweighed them by a factor of maybe a hundred or two hundred times. And subsequent research by Ross Wanless and Ben Dilley and others from the FITS uh, in conjunction with the RSPB confirmed that mice indeed are quite significant predators of seabird chicks. So this is one of Ben Dilley's pictures showing uh, mice coming and attacking a, a Tristan albatross chick on Gough Island. And a big healthy chick can be killed within a space of two or three days um, just by action of mice coming at night and attacking it. You can see the chick really has no response to these predators um, and the parent just sits there and does nothing about it. And the consequence of this is obviously quite significant. So this is typically what we see if you follow breeding season of a wandering type albatross. Um, they lay in the middle of summer, towards the end of summer, the eggs hatch, and then there's a some mortality of small chicks, but once they get through that small chick phase, they should make it through the end of the year. By comparison, what we see with Tristan albatrosses is through the early part of winter in particular, um, we see just this steady attrition of chicks caused by mouse predation. And this is really why the Tristan albatross is listed as critically endangered, why it was critical to do something about eradicating mice from Gough Island. 
And, but it's not just the Tristan albatross is affected, virtually all of the seabirds and probably the land birds on, on uh, Gough are also impacted by mouse predation. And we can really see the impact of this. I've lived this, this period. So my first trip to Gough with John Cooper in 1984, I might go back to my old notebook and I just can't believe the numbers that I was writing down, but I, I have the memory of seeing just so many birds. We would turn on a spotlight and you would be inundated with birds at night. You know, tens of thousands of primes you would see within half an hour, um, thousands of soft plumage petrels and, and so on. And if you go there now, there's still birds around at night, but the numbers are, are really just a, a fraction, um, a shocking small fraction of, of what it was before. And many species have just disappeared. So we no longer see subantarctic shearwaters or greyback storm petrels um, around the base on Gough. They're just gone. So, Thanks to uh, a very long research project, um, we've been pushing for a long time to have Gough Island restored. Um, and that finally came to fruition this year, which was really exciting. And we have all of this to thank to basically the New Zealanders because they were the people who started this whole crazy game. So initially to get rid of rodents on islands, people were poison baiting by hand, small islands. You could go out and broadcast bait by hand or put bait in tubes to protect it from um, perhaps other birds and things. But it was really a, a limited to small islands where you could operate by hand. And then the real breakthrough occurred in 2001 when Campbell Island was eradicated of rats, over a hundred square kilometer island. Um, and the technology used was to have helicopters with bait spreading buckets slung underneath and teams of people loading those buckets and then very precise flying to make sure that every bit of the island got covered with bait. And following on the success of Campbell Island, there's been a whole series of large islands tackled. Um, Macquarie, uh, another project that Keith Springer was involved with, um, was uh, more challenging because the island was slightly larger, but it was mainly because um, it was not just rats, it was mice and rabbits as well. So it, different techniques needed perhaps to tackle those multiple suites of species. South Georgia was a massive project, a three-year project. Um, fortunately, the island was divided by glaciers, so it was possible to spread the eradication over multiple years. That's not the case on an island like Marion. We have to do it all in one shot. We can't afford to just do part of the island and come back the following year because the mice obviously will breed up and spread. Um, up until Gough, the largest island that had been successfully eradicated for mice was Antipodes, 21 square kilometers, done in 2016, another New Zealand island. And so Gough was quite a, a step up again. Um, so three times bigger than the Antipodes, 65 square kilometers. It was scheduled to take place in 2019. It was then delayed for um, various logistical reasons to 2020. We were all set to go. Um, some of the team was already on Gough uh, when COVID struck and delayed the whole thing for another year. Um, but finally this year it happened. Um, Chris and Michelle who are in the room were there for the whole thing. Must have been incredibly exciting to be there. Um, they had a fleet of four helicopters, um, several hundred tons of poison bait, just the most amazing logistical operation to deliver bait to every part of this incredibly rugged um, island. And so I'm not sure if Chris is in that picture, but Chris was one of the bait loaders. Um, so there you can see the bucket taking maybe seven, 800 kilos of bait at a time. And then the helicopters flying specific track lines to deposit that bait across the island. Um, and quite a high baiting density because of the dense vegetation, problems with slugs um, eating the bait. Um, so it was a baiting density of eight to 10 kilos of poison bait. Um, with all of the island treated twice and densely vegeta vegetated areas and cliffs baited three times. Um, and the baiting was done in winter for various reasons I'll come to in a minute, um, which is always challenging because the days are short and the weather is lousy. Um, the initial baiting run was fairly smoothly done in June and then July the weather was appalling and there was a long hiatus between baiting events 
And finally, on the 2nd of August, the baiting was completed. And here's one of Michelle's pictures taken from one of the other helicopters and just gives you some idea of the, the ruggedness of Goff. And you can imagine the challenge of trying to deliver bait across a landscape like that. Even with a helicopter, it's challenging because of the wind conditions across the island. And we won't know for sure whether it's succeeded. Um, you can't prove that you've eradicated something. You can just wait and hope for the best. Um, typically, we wait two to three years, and then we might uh, use a, a whole suite of different approaches, perhaps sniffer dogs, track pads, various baiting techniques. Um, and if we still can't find any mice on the island, um, we can declare it successful. So the signs so far are encouraging. There haven't been any signs of mice in the few months since the baiting completed, um, but we won't know for sure um, that it actually worked yet. But it's extremely encouraging for the Marion program that the Gough project was able to be delivered. Um, the project ran out of Cape Town um, using South African logistics support, using a South African uh, helicopter company, um, with New Zealand pilots, but um, you know all of the, the infrastructure was sourced in South Africa, um, and a lot of the equipment that was used um, has been carried over from the Gough project to the Marion project. So this has been a huge boost to the Mouse Free Marion initiative. But let's go back to Marion. So now that we realise mice are a problem, um, Russ Wanless's research on Gough suggests that they're really mainly a problem when they're the only introduced mammal. When there are rats on the island, the rats suppress the mouse population and they don't become, they don't reach the kinds of densities where they start to resort to feeding on seabirds. Um, similarly, when there are cats or other predators on the island, their populations don't build up. Of course, I've just been singing the praises of re removing cats from the island. So after the mouse um, 1991 was when the cats left. So what happened on Marion after the cats left? And the short answer is nothing happened for a decade or so. The first inkling we had of a problem was 2002 when we had the first attacks on wandering albatrosses. Um, they were few and far between, but obviously worrying. And uh, given what we were seeing on Gough, um, on a much greater scale, um, it, was, it was cause for significant concern. And then in 2009, we saw the first attack on sooty albatross. So this is a summer breeding albatross. Um, late summer, we were starting to see attacks on big chicks, typically on the head, which was pretty bizarre because most of the wandering albatross attacks are on the body. And then 2015, it just went pear-shaped in a big way. So all of a sudden we had 5% of sooty, gray-headed and light-mantled chicks being attacked across the island. And we have to ask the question, why did it take so long? If it was just a question of getting rid of the, mice, rid of the cats, why did it take so long? And what's also been happening on Marion is like many high latitude areas, it's experiencing very rapid climate change. So here's a famous picture from the Fanzinder and Backer expedition in 1966, showing the ice plateau on Marion Island. Over the last 60 years or so, the temperature on Marion has been increasing by 0.2 degrees per decade, which might not sound like a lot, but that is pretty significant. And the rainfall has decreased 40%, which is really significant. This is what the ice plateau looks like now. It is no longer an ice plateau. Um, we've just about lost all of the permanent ice on the top of Marion. It's a picture from April 2008. There's a person standing in that ice cave there. You can just make out the little person. Um, that's the same ice arch one year later to show you how quickly the ice was receding at that time. And literally now, if you go up to the plateau, you really struggle to find any. And this warmer and drier climate allows mice on the island to start breeding earlier. And so their population cycles seasonally and by breeding earlier and having this more favorable uh, climatic condition during summer, the mouse population densities have been peaking at ever higher values over the last 30 or 40 years. And those higher densities have pushed the prey base of the mice, which is dominantly the native um, invertebrate biomass on the island has been decreasing. And so we've got more mice, more desperate for food, particularly at the end of uh, summer. Uh, so if we look uh, how the mouse attacks spread, in 2009, when we had our first attacks on sooty albatrosses, we had attacks occurring on both sides of the island. So 
those are independent learning events. And it's akin to the blue tits and gray tits in the UK in the 1930s, simultaneously discovering that if you peck through the foil on the top of a milk bottle, you can drink some nice creamy milk. Um, and, but once that behavior has been learned at a site, it tends to persist. Um, 2015 was the driest year on record for Marion, probably resulted in the highest densities of mice ever. And that's when we had attacks occurring all over the island. And every year since then, we've been documenting the spread of the attacks. And it pretty much mirrors the distribution of prey. Um, so the mice have learned that this is a good thing to do. And then within those colonies, we tend to find little clusters of attack. So there's this, cult, this, this uh, cultural transmission of, of attack. So these are some very unhappy gray-headed albatross chicks um, being attacked on Marion. 2017 saw a, another leap in uh, impact where we started to see the first attacks on adults. Um, so we had an attack on an adult northern giant petrel on Marion. We saw an attack on a Tristan albatross on Gough. And just this year, while we were on Gough preparing for the eradication, we actually had an old female Tristan albatross killed by a mouse attack. Um, so it's not just the chicks that are at risk from mice if we don't do anything about it. Um, and once you start losing the adult population, then the, the uh, decrease is very dramatic indeed. So. What do we have to do in order to eradicate mice from the island? For an eradication to succeed, every mouse must be exposed to the bait. We need to show that every mouse will actually eat the bait if it's given the choice. Um, and so we've done the research behind this. So this pink bait is specially dyed. Um, we put it out in an area and then trap mice to make sure that they've all eaten it. It's non-toxic bait, just to make sure that they like the bait. And then we need to make sure that all the mice die as a result. And getting ethical clearance to do this was a bit of a nightmare, but we finally got to do a toxicity trial and show that the bait that we're planning to use will kill all of the mice that eat it. But it really comes down to the logistical planning. And this is where Keith Springer is really essential to the operation. So as I say, Keith is in the building, um, he was involved in South Georgia. He was uh, led the Macquarie operation. Um, so he comes with an enormous pedigree. He's just been stuck on Lord Howe Island for umpteen months by COVID, eradicating rats on Lord Howe. So this is what he does. Um, and he's been to Marion. This is Keith on Marion a few years ago where he produced a draft operational plan. Um, so he knows what he's getting into. So if Keith tells me that this is feasible, then I'm inclined to believe him. Um, so, as I say, it involves uh, using helicopters to spread the bait. It requires very precise flying. There's a very narrow tolerance, so the pilots have these visual guides to make sure that they stay on the track. Very limited tolerance on either side. So this is one of Keith's images showing flight lines by an experienced baiting pilot. And you can see those lines are pretty much as parallel as you can get. And when you consider this is in a windy subantarctic environment, it's quite incredible. By contrast, this was um, somebody who I actually flew with uh, quite a bit um, at one stage, um, who had a lot of experience flying this particular helicopter. And this was his best attempt at flying the lines. And he was so bad that he couldn't be used for the eradication. So it's really crucial that you have the right people to do this. There's no point getting all of the equipment and bait and everything there. And then you put the helicopter in the hand of someone who's inexperienced because you'll get the baiting. And if we don't bait the whole island, there will be mice left and the whole thing is for nothing. So it really is crucial that we get the right people to do this. The other major concern, of course, is mitigating the impacts on non-target species. Unfortunately, the only toxin that we know is effective for eradication as opposed to control is a not particularly specific toxin. It does impact other vertebrates. Um, and so we have to manage to reduce the impact on the native um, bird life on the island. The species that are most at risk are the scavenging birds that might eat carcasses of mice, um, or they potentially could eat the bait directly as well in the case of things like sheep bills. So 
The experience from South Georgia suggests that the species of highest concern is the brown skewer. The impact on South Georgia was rated as medium to high, but the eradication on South Georgia took place in summer when the skewers are present in breeding. And that's not going to be the case on Marion. So that uh, should be much less of a problem. Uh, we've currently got a research project on Marion looking at um, how skewer numbers change through the year, amongst other things. And by the middle of winter, there's literally only a handful of skewers left on the island. So we're not too worried about skewers. Um, the species of greatest concern is the lesser sheath bill. Um, there's never been uh, a an eradication attempt on an island with lesser sheath bills before, but South Georgia has greater or snowy sheath bills, and there the impact was rated as medium. Uh, we know from Marion that they will eat the uh, dead mice, and they probably will eat the bait as well, some of them at least, um, so it is a significant concern. Um, but it's something that we're working on managing. There are a couple of options, um, and I think um, we, we will manage the problem. So just very broadly in terms of how the mouth free marion is planned to take place, the baiting will take place in winter when the mice are hungry, and they're not breeding, so there's no risk of young mice in a, in a burrow being not exposed to bait. It's also a time when uh, the, the, the risk to non-target species is lowest, so skewers in particular will be away from the island, and so hopefully that will be much less of an issue. The challenge, of course, is again, we've got short days and potentially lousy weather, so we just have to have a big enough baiting window to make sure that we get enough good weather days to make it happen. Um, on Goff, uh, the baiting started um, towards the end of June. I think in the case of Marion, because it's a little further south, we'll probably try to start a little earlier, perhaps late May or early June. Um, I've already stressed, I think, the, the need to recruit the right, right personnel, particularly for the flying operations, um, but it, it, it's really a, a massive team effort and you have to make sure that everybody's very committed to uh, to, to the project. And then of course, once you, you've done the baiting, that's just the first phase of the operation. We then need to make sure that mice don't get back to the island. Um, and so that means very strict biosecurity on any vessels visiting the island to make sure that mice can't get there. Any ships that are going to Marion must uh, be inspected carefully ideally with uh, trained rodent sniffing dogs to make sure there's absolutely no risk. In South Georgia, they have had one rat get back to the island despite um, fairly strict um, biosecurity measures. So this is, this is a real concern that we need to address. We do have quite a good biosecurity program on the ship for all of our personal kit to prevent seeds and things getting ashore, um, but that's going to need to be tightened up even more, particularly around the cargo going down to Marion Island. And so that's more or less the end of my story. Um, the big stumbling block at this stage now is just raising the funds. Um, these operations are not cheap, as you can imagine. If you're going to have a fleet of helicopters on standby for two to three months, you've got to charter ships to take you back and forth to the islands, and you've got to pay helicopter pilot fees, which are not trivial, particularly when they are not uh, local pilots. Um, so it's a significant amount of money that needs to be raised. Keith and uh, Anton can talk more about that. But there is a crowdfunding appeal. Uh, you can go to the Mouse Free Marion organization, org.za site and make a donation if you like to. This project is being run jointly by the Department of Environment Affairs, whose name I can't remember now, DFFE, um, and BirdLife South Africa. Um, uh, through a non-profit organization that's been set up specifically for this operation. Um, I think we've got an excellent start. We've got great people setting up the project. Now we just need to deliver the funds to make it happen. And hopefully um, in a year or three's time, I think we're, we're aiming for 2024, um, we will remove mice from the island and we'll allow that very significant population of wandering albatrosses to live forth in perpetuity without the risk of being scalped alive by mice.
But that's my story. Um, I hope I haven't gone on too long. I meant to set my stopwatch, but I forgot in the excitement of speaking. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions uh, and Anton and Keith can also help. So thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everyone. And thanks very much, uh, Peter, for a great talk. Uh, there's a huge amount that one could ask, I suppose. The one question I just want to ask is, uh, is, has any work been done on the invertebrate, terrestrial invertebrate um, populations um, on the island, um, just with respect to what is actually there and then possibly what the effects might be um, at this time and also into the future in terms of the baiting and so forth on other, other biota like the invertebrata possibly? Sure. Um, so, yeah, the, the inverts on the island are, are pretty well known. Steve Chown, who's a really world-leading scientist, um, he cut his teeth on Marion. So he did his PhD research on Marion, um, on the weevils and things, um, and since then has done a lot of work looking at invasive species. So there's a whole bunch of invasive invertebrates as well. Um, okay. But, but the, the, the mouse impact on the inverts is, is horrendous. Um, so one of the more... Uh, indicative things is, is to be fortunate enough to go and spend a day or two on Prince Edward and see the difference between Prince Edward and Marion. So Prince Edward has no mice, it's never had any introduced mammals, um, whereas Marion has had cats and mice. So the, the density of birds was reduced by cats and the density of the inverts has been hammered by mice. Um, and the, the terrestrial systems are, are starkly different. You know, the vegetation on, on Prince Edward is much more lush. You see flightless moths on Marion. You really have to go looking to find a flightless moth these days. They've just about all been eaten. In terms of the, the impact of the baiting, um, the bridificum that's used um, doesn't affect invertebrates. So it's not really an issue. Um, okay. There's a small problem in that they can potentially if they eat the bait, they can store the bridificum in their body. And then if they're eaten by a bird, so there is a secondary poisoning route that way. Um, so there's a small risk to things like Kaguel and Turns. But you know, in the big scheme of things, the benefits of getting rid of mice are worth any um, collateral damage as long as it's not too severe. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I'm going to go to the chat section quickly. Um, Anton, I don't think you've answered this one yet from uh, Marilise Berger. Um, she says another question, a previous question was answered. Um, but why do the birds allow the mice to attack them? Or is it a case of uh, tiring them out over a period of time uh, that they cannot sleep and thus get overwhelmed and um, give up, as she stated? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it's just it's just one of those quirky things about animals that have evolved on islands. They just don't have an appropriate response. And it's not just seabirds. Um, you, you look at New Zealand, um, you know, some of the pictures of rats just eating adult birds on the nest. You know, they, they just, even the adults have no response. They just sit there and continue to incubate while a rat walks up and bites them. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it's it's... If you've never faced a predator, you do, you're totally naive. Um, that's one of the joys of going to an island. You can walk up to a bird and it won't run away from you. Um, but if you have an intent in mind, it's, uh, it's not good for the bird, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I was a bit distracted because I was also reading the chat. There's some really nice <laughs> comments in there. Um, they, they really are. It's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Maybe, I wonder if we can, um, um, Sibylla, you have a, a similar story. Do you want to share your story that you, you've mentioned it briefly in the, um, in the chat section, but what, um, what happened on, on Chumbe Island um, that I've been to? I haven't been to Gojo Marion, but if you would. Thank you, Ryan. I mean, a fantastic presentation, Peter. I was so impressed. Our conditions were so much easier. We didn't need helicopters. We could do all by people walking across the very dense forest and uh, spreading protifacum. It took us like three weeks, but we got rid of the ratos ratos totally. Luckily, we didn't have other mammals on the island, and we tested uh, Potifacum on Pigus latro, the coconut crab, before, and uh, it tolerates that, so there was no problem. So, yeah, and this is like 22 years ago, and we have been wet free since then. 
uh, but it took us three years to prepare for the campaign and find the right approach to it. So that's just summarizing a very long story in, in a nutshell. Yes. But I, yeah. I mean, these vets are so, so smart, you know, you have to really uh, totally, uh, you have to, to spread the poison very quickly and, and totally saturating the island to not allow them to learn to avoid the, the bait. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, the, the tropical islands are, are trickier. So the success rates with eradications for rodents generally are, are pretty good, 90% plus. But the, the, most of the failures have occurred in the tropics. Um, and it's partly because there's more food available, we think, um, but also competition with crabs. The crabs eat the bait. So you've really got to put a lot of bait down if you've got a lot of crabs, because otherwise the crabs remove the bait before the rodents get to it. So there's, there's definite challenges in the tropics. And, one of the reasons why it took us such a long time to get going on Gough was the RSPB, um, their previous attempt at an eradication was on Henderson Island in the Pitcairn group in the South Pacific, and that failed. Um, we're still not 100% sure why it failed, but probably a combination of too many crabs, not enough bait, and too many other food sources. Um, I think it had been a particularly wet year and there was a lot of other food. So there's a whole bunch of factors that can potentially derail these things. Um, but in the subantarctic, because the system is quite predictably seasonal, um, the risk is quite a lot lower than it is in the tropics. Actually, I mean, we had to learn also that because of Birkos lateral, the very huge coconut crabs on the floor, the, the rats had started breeding in the trees, you know, to avoid, to avoid the, the, the crabs. So we had to get the poison into the trees, putting them on twigs and, and branches to, to reach the rats. So it was a quite a different campaign from normal. And at the end, uh, when we wanted to remove all these carcasses from the island, we couldn't find them because Pico's lateral, the coconut crabs had eaten the carcasses. <laughs> so we didn't even find many to remove from the island. So that was quite an interesting campaign. But it succeeded. I mean, we have been rat free for the last two decades now. Of course, we do uh, monitoring on chew sticks uh, and uh, regular definitely checking of all uh, cargo food uh, taken to the island. Definitely, I mean, this has to be a continuous monitoring of uh, uh, any anything brought to the island to avoid reintroduction of. But we have managed to do this for two decades now. Wonderful. Uh, it's just such. You know, as I say, it's it's like. There's, there's so few conservation stories where you can reset the clock and, and these, these are just such exciting projects to be involved with. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, it's been a huge story, but happy to share more details, but there's such different conditions to, to your place. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Sibylle. Um, I'm going to go to Rob. Rob, how are you doing? It's been a while. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, everyone. I'm doing very well. I hope everyone is doing well. Thanks for the great talk, Peter. I'm not going to put myself on video because I'm a bit ugly and my bandwidth is fairly low. Um, so I've got a question for you, Peter, and that is, um, has anyone thought of a biological control? Uh, I'm a raptor biologist, as I'm sure you, you're quite aware. And um, I'm thinking of barn owl, a few barn owls uh, chasing uh, rice, uh, rice and mats, <laughs> mice and rats around the island would be a lot cheaper than spending five million on, on poison baits. Um, you know, yeah. I'm thinking of barn owl. You've also got to think, one has always got to think, what are the consequences once the mice are gone? Now, I'm thinking uh, an albatross is way too large for a barn owl. It would never attack it. Um, there might be some smaller petrels which they may, might go for. But of course, the response of a barn owl is generally to leave an island. So you, you have your barn owls, you put the nest boxes up for them, they clean up uh, the mice and the, and the rats, and then they try and leave and, and they die out. And your problem is solved in, in both senses. Your thoughts on that, please. Okay, well, so there, there are a couple of problems. One is uh, biocontrol is, is just that, it's a control, it's not an eradication. So it, it's, it's not gonna solve the problem, it'll perhaps reduce it. But um, uh, attempts at biocontrol using generalist predators uh, on islands uh, are fraught with problems. Um, so, the, you know, the history of that is, is horrendous. You know, let's introduce mongoose to control the rats and the mongoose just go wild and eat all the native stuff. Um, 
if you look at what happened on on Dassin, you know, there was a, a, a burgeoning little population of leeches, storm petrels, and then at one barn owl arrived and ate them all. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, we're not going to be in the business of introducing barn owls, I'm afraid. Um, they, they are just too generalist in their in their predation, and they would make short shrift of prions, anything from prion size down, probably even soft plumes down, would just get nailed by barn owls. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, a bit of a non-starter. We had we had some helpful fellow who wanted to go and shoot all the mice on Goff. So we pointed out that it was perhaps half a million mice and we would need a lot of bullets. Um, I see um, Sibyl is wanting to yes, say something. Yes, yes. Let's go. Sibyl, I'm just going to... There we go. Just unmute yourself, Sibyl, please. Yeah. For Ratos Ratos, there is biological control, which is very specialized, which is a monocell. Sarcosustra singaporensis, which we proposed, uh, it's for the tropicals because it, the host is a python, the python, you need a sna snake to be the host and the rats are being eradicated. Uh, it's very specialized on ratos, ratos and mice. However, of course, it's introduction of a, a lion species, exotic species, it's Asian, this monocell, but very specialized. And we did not get permission to do it. Otherwise we would have tried that. And we thought it would be very successful, but uh, we couldn't because we do have pythons on the island. And uh, so the conditions would have been perfect. That's why we had to re then go back to the normal poison. Yeah. But have you heard of Singaporeensis? I mean, Sarcosystem Singaporeensis for Ratos Ratos. It works in the tropics. I think it should work very well uh, in tropical islands because uh, pythons, of course, don't live in Antarctic islands. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Subilib. Um, Ryan, any thoughts on that before I? Uh, um, Leslie, she, Leslie was up. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Martini, how are you doing? It's asking you to unmute. Andrew, do you want to ask a question? Just on yes, the There we go. Yes, thank you, Ruan. Just a quick one. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the informative uh, presentation, uh, Peter. Um, I was just thinking if uh, it has not happened uh, at all, that there should be a way of creating this island as a uh, tourism destination. Okay, um, so it, there's there's a, the Marion and, and Prince Edward are protected areas, which is the highest level of um, conservation status under South African law. And in their wisdom, the drafters of the management plan for the island have decided that it, it's not suitable for tourism. My personal take on that is that that's not necessarily the right way to go. I think there is scope to do tourism. Um, the Australians do it, uh, the New Zealanders do it to their subantarctic islands. It's got to be very carefully managed, obviously, but you know, it's, it's such an amazing experience to go there. Um, I think I absolutely agree that it would be wonderful to be able to share those islands with, with more than just the few researchers who are fortunate enough to go there. BirdLife is planning to run a, a, a cruise ship to Marion in January next year, um, their so-called flock to Marion, um, if COVID permits, um, but obviously it won't go ashore, um, but the idea is to go down um, with a whole bunch of mad bird watchers. So if you do want to go and at least see the islands, but not go ashore, that is an option. Um, but but in terms of the current management plan, there's no land-based tourism allowed. Um, maybe that will change, but it would always have to be done under very strictly controlled conditions. The islands are quite sensitive to trampling pressure as well. Um, so one would have to put in place um, some, some designated pathways um, to protect the vegetation and so on. Um, and, and then all of the biosecurity uh, requirements would have to be very strictly enforced but but that's standard for any antarctic type of uh, tourism these days um, it's very responsible tourism 
Thank you very much, um, Andrew, for your question. Any other questions? Um, I think most of the questions in the chat have been answered. Thank you very much for that, um, Anton. I'm just paging through the full page. Ron, I just, um, I don't have a really have a question, although I have a sense of urgency when I listen to things like this. And Peter is talking about the funding and he's talking about the, you know, the fact that you, you have to go crowdfunding, you have to find ways. And I think the, the bottleneck in it all is not what to do, but how to fund what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. I think somehow we must sort of put our heads uh, together and find a way to speed up the, the funding initiative. I also have a chat to um, Michele Menegan about the funding uh, initiative, the My Planet initiative. Maybe we could link this, but I'm asking the listeners who might have ideas and initiatives to to please the audience, just write to us and let us know. We can investigate ways, uh, Peter. Um, but it seems to me that's where the issue lies. It's eventually in the funding. Problem is clear, solutions are clear, it's getting the funding to get it done. Mm. I, yeah. I, I always sort of thought that if I was a, a billionaire, that that's what my philanthropic work would be. And you know, I'd have a... Uh, uh, Fund, fund a ship that just goes around doing eradications. Um, but we, we have been quite fortunate in, in having the support of uh, Frederick Paulson, um, who was one of the major sponsors of the South Georgia eradication. And uh, Frederick visited Prince Edward during um, an Antarctic circumnavigation a few years ago. And uh, subsequent donations from him have been funding the, the sort of seed funding for the whole project. Um, and he's, very much involved in, in moving this forward. So um, yeah, I think there is, there is some promise there. We, we have a, a campaign manager who's basically a fundraiser who's just been appointed um, because the kinds of money we're talking about, it's gonna be a struggle to get within South Africa. So we're targeting Europe and North America principally to raise the bulk of the funds. Um, I think we have about um, a third of the funds already secured. So we're looking for about two thirds more. So it's, you know, we've, I think, you know, we, we, we're not on the bones of our ass. We're not, yeah, I think, I think we've done pretty well to get where we are. I see Anton's got his hand up, so he'll probably have a much more considered response. Um, but that's, that's my from the, from the comment. Anton, you want to say something? No, no, I'm just uh, to support what you've said, Peter, and to say that um, we have recently appointed a fundraising manager um, who is what, who is attending this talk, Heidi Whitman. I think she is in the group tonight. Um, she's based in the US and uh, has quite a lot of experience in raising funds for big conservation projects. And, and so Peter's right. We have it's, it's an expensive project. I mean, it's logistically hugely complex. These operations don't come cheap but it's a once-off investment for a long-term um, conservation benefit, which will be there in perpetuity. And so the campaign, the, the crowdfunding campaign, the Sponsor Hector initiative that is on our website is one of the elements of that fundraising strategy. Uh, but we will also be approaching um, foundations and, and donors elsewhere in the world. And I think we have a, a compelling story to tell. You know, it's, it's challenging mm. in these COVID impacted times, um, but there are, you know, there are many people that contribute to making a difference. Um, as Peter said in his talk, um, you know, those of us that have been involved in conservation for a while, you know, a lot of the time the conservation projects are sort of um, associated with kind of incremental nudges in behavior and attitudes, which is important, but here we've got an opportunity to, um, to really kind of address significant threats and for the consequences, the positive consequences, to start materializing very quickly. And I think for a lot of potential fundraisers, people, you know, they are enthusiastic about supporting those kind of projects. So we have a big challenge. There's lots of money to raise. Um, and we'd certainly be very grateful for any ideas that the audience might have. And I'm sure Heidi who is uh, on, you know, in this presentation or in the, in the, sort of in the group um, will be very pleased to hear any um, suggestions that you might have. But uh, 
that is certainly probably the most significant um, challenge that we face in terms of getting to where we need to be to implement this, this really important project and to make a, a huge conservation difference. And as Peter said, you know, I don't think that the South Africans really got the recognition that they deserve for really being pioneers in eradicating cats from an island when very few people thought it was possible. Um, we have the opportunity now to you know, achieve an incredible conservation legacy for an, a very important island. And, um, and so we need to raise the profile of the project and to get people excited about it and to you know, get people supportive of it. So um, yeah, this talk that Peter provided, I can see from the comments that everybody is um, you know, of the view that this is, you know, it's an important project. It's one that we know that we can do. Um, you know, there are challenges, but we need to overcome those. And, uh, you know, thanks, Chris and others from LCA for the opportunity. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting project with many, many challenges. But, uh, yeah, it's something that uh, I think many of us feel, you know, especially those that have been involved in Marin Island work, but in, including those that haven't. You know, if, if we can kind of contribute in, in a variety of different ways to, you know, make such a big difference to, you know, the species that breed on that island and the ecology of that island, you know, what an amazing achievement for us to be involved in, so, yeah. Mm. I'm looking for one dollar per birder in the world. We will get there quickly. <laughs> That's all we need to do. That's all we need to do. Um, I want to um, small, small, small chunks. That's the way to go. <laughs> um, Heidi, uh, I just, you, your screen just went on. Do you have a few words that you want to share all the way from the US? I'm asking you to unmute. Sure. Um, I'm very excited to join the Mouse Free Marion team. I actually, um, as a young person, worked on eradicating rats from um, Anacapa Island off the um, US West Coast. Um, so I, I'm just personally very interested in the project as well. At this point, in addition to the crowdfunding initiative, we're really looking for major gift support. So I'll be talking to individuals and foundations who can make a big dent in our balance um, because we would like to do this as soon as possible. Um, so um, if you have suggestions on folks that I should be talking to, or if there's an introduction that you can make, um, please let me know. Thank you very much, Heidi. Lovely. Um, Sandra, I'm just going to try one last time. You have a green arrow. Do you have any questions to ask? Can I unmute you? To ask to unmute. I don't know. No, I think my question was answered. Thank you very much. It was answered earlier on. Okay, I was one, wondering about the impact of the bait on other wildlife, but it was answered. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you Thank for you a very wonderful much. talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Sandra. Any other questions? I think we did everything in the chat section and uncovered most of those. Any other questions out there? You can just jump up and down, wave your hands. Well, I, I, <laughs> I just want to say to Peter, Peter, we now nearly an hour and a half into this talk, and there are 84 people still hanging around for something to be said or something to happen or somebody to jump in. Otherwise, they would all have left. I think mm. people are intrigued. So I'm not sure, Rod Cassidy or any one of your colleagues who would like to come in and, and just share with us. Uh, I think, Moret, what we can do is um, now set the, uh, the system in a way that people can unmute themselves. And, and if you want to come in, come in, because 84 people are not hanging around for nothing. There's a reason. And my compliments to you, Peter, because yes. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, his wine glass is empty. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it, it says something to me. It says to me that people are catching this. They understand this. They they see the problem. They actually want to learn more. Uh, um, so anybody who would like to come in and just share with us, please do so. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, I just want to ask um, Pete. Um, I'm going to speak for Tan because she doesn't want to ask. She's sitting behind my shoulder here. You can see her there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she says, what do you do if in two years' time on Gough you find a small family of rats living on top of 
of mice living on top of one of the mountains. I mean, you know, what, what are you going to do then? Are you going to repeat the whole operation? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crock of shit, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, look, I mean, if, if, it, if, it goes, if it goes wrong, it's not a, not a happy situation. So Henderson, um, they, they're kind of getting towards a point where I think they're going to try again, but it's, it's very dispiriting if it fails, obviously. Um, yeah. And that's why, that's why you really have to kind of over-engineer. So South Georgia was a single baiting operation for most, most part, low, ba low baiting density, and it worked. And people say, well, you know, if you could do the whole of South Georgia for less money than you want to do for Marion, you know, it, it's a fraction of the size. But, but you know, we, we, we really don't want to get into a situation where we fail. So, you know, we could probably manage with with a half or two thirds of the amount of bait and 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 it probably would work but you know there's just there's that risk factor so um you over engineer it and you hope for the best but there is always a chance it could fail it's you know it's just yeah all you can do is uh, i mean keith's probably best to speak to this um the guys who do this um they they've you know you've got to take your, your hat off to them it's a very stressful operation to to kind of oversee and make sure that it all works well there's a lot riding on making sure that you do it right yeah yeah no i agree i, I just want to tell people i mean you saw some pictures of those islands everybody but th those islands are, are brutal i mean they're valleys and deep valleys and the 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 black lava has got holes inside it it's 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 a it's really really tough 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 terrain so um, yeah, good luck. Good luck with it. Yeah. So so I mean, in terms of the caves and holes and things, um, you know, we've we've done various trials there to make sure that the mice living in caves actually come out. So you put dyed bait around the entrance to caves where it would reach from the aerial drop, um, and even the mice living right at the back of the cave have the bait in them. So um, you know, th we think we're we're pretty safe, but you know, high risk areas you just double or triple bait, or you potentially go in and hand bait if necessary, mm -hmm. if there's a, a particular concern. On Marion, one of the biggest challenges is going to be the bases, and that's why we're really keen to see the old base removed because you know, you've got mice potentially living in the walls or um, you know associated with the base, uh, and and that creates challenges. It has to be hand baited. Um, so if we can remove the old base before the eradication, so much the better. Yeah. Thanks, Peter and, and, and Rod, while we have you on, thank you for putting the pressure on Peter to do the talk. Uh, Rod is the one that uh, made this happen, so thank you very much, Rod. Uh, I think it's a massive added value. Thank you. Any other ideas? You know, there's, um, I just, I just want to, I just want to say, there's somebody here who was one of the cat, um, the cat, the cat eradicators, and he volunteered for us. Yasha Potkita, who's now living in Wales. Um, Yasha, do you want to have any comments? <laughs> Put him on a spot. Yasha is, um, he lives in Wales, but he's volunteered at us. He's, he does a lot of volunteering at wildlife projects. And he's a great artist, but he worked on Marion as one of the cat eradicators under Martin Vesta back in the day. Yeah. We have to put him on the spot. <laughs> Yasha, are you there? Yeah, I, Before you, you run, I just wanted to say that Yasha, in addition to his uh, cat eradication and cat hunting contributions, has also facilitated a massive contribution from his community and cat hunting friends to the Sponsor a nectar, sponsor a hectare initiative. He donated 45 hectares. Um, or he facilitated the donation of 45 hectares through friends and colleagues and cat hunters. So we're very grateful for his contribution, both in terms of getting rid of cats, but also contributing funds to the Master Marine Project. Thanks, uh, Andrea Angel. Yeah, sure. Have you got anything to say? I, um, Rod, I don't know. I can't unmute me. But we can hear you. Yeah, you're unmuted now. Oh. No, I don't know. It is. I, I was a little bit um, late with the talk, but I mean, the only thing I can say is I wish I could do more. 
I mean, it's so important. That island is one of the best things. Oh, it's beautiful. So, I mean, um, I can't say much. I am just grateful they're going to re get rid of those bloody mice. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> much I can't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you talk about the bloody mice and the bloody cat, Peter, have you had <laughs> cat lovers taking you on? God, no, no, I, I have two cats, so so I do like cats, but those cats were bad. <laughs> <laughs> they were contextually, they were contextually bad. That's the point. No, no, no they they were bastards. I mean, I remember we walked. <laughs> Um, something like 3,000 kilometers in nine months after those cats. I mean, so, and I mean, I was, um, and we've been there for a long time, so at least we got rid of them. So it was a good thing. Uh, and, uh, but I don't know, thank you very much for the talk. And um, I can't wait the day you people telling me there's no mice there. <laughs> thank, thank you, Asha. Yeah, You're a good man. Okay. You're the okay. finest fellow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Unmute me, please. <laughs> <laughs> now you're unmuted. Mute yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, quiet. <laughs> no good sense. Um, I've got a. Asha learned his English on Marian Island. <laughs> <laughs> I got a WhatsApp here from Johan. Um, yes. Simply saying thanks for the talk. Great one. Besides monetary value. How else can we possibly help this great initiative? Peter? Or Heidi? Or anybody? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess, you know, just spreading the word. As Anton said, you know, it's about raising the profile of the project internationally. Um, and as you said, Chris, you know, you just need uh, a lot of people to give a little amount. Um, so, you know, um, if people know about it, I didn't show the video, but Stefan's video of the mouse attacking the albatross chick is worth its weight in gold. Uh, you know, we we described the problem to various people uh, and said, you know, you, you talk about it and they kind of, their eyes glaze over and then you show them that video and they just say, you know, where do I sign the dotted line? So so Stefan and Janine did an amazing job in just catching that, that horrendous footage. Um. Uh, documentaries been made, distributed, done? There, there was a film crew on Marion during COVID now, um, took took a bunch of scientists down um, and as part of the deal um, because, because of COVID there, there was very limited research uh, team on the island. Um, so there will be some footage from that. Uh, Marion did feature on a South African docky. There was a a film crew that was embedded within the team for about six months, maybe six, seven, eight years ago. Um, so th there has been opportunity for people to film there, but um, it's still it's it's still a sought after destination for documentary makers because it is mm -hmm. just such an amazing place, and relatively few people have been there. Ron, Ron, um, I think we also have to investigate the possibility of get, getting this onto Water Bay or somehow get this done. Uh, maybe Peter, do a, a we redo your talk in the sense, Peter, that we it's a narrated talk with the you know film footage in, in the background, and yes. then dis disseminate that through Water Bay. Yes. Water Bay, in essence, I'm sure you know of Water Bay. Uh, but they, uh, the the one of the mother companies uh, off the fence is also the same group who won this um, Oscar for Octopus, my teacher. And Ruan, I think we must see if we can do something about that. Yes, it's completely possible. It's yeah. a, um, it's also a, it, it, the Water Bay Network, Peter, Heidi, and Anthony. If you don't know, um, it's it's basically the Netflix of conservation. Um, they they barely just started and they have a massive following, but it is a it's a beautiful platform to portray something and you can uh, share your links and your websites and the fundraising. It's it's it can all stay there and it has an international reach, which is quite, which I yeah. think would help. Cool, cool um, idea. Ruan is from Ruan is from Homebrew and Homebrew is one of the patrons of the LCA. I think we can get something. I mean, it doesn't have to cost thousands. You know, we get a 
quality, high quality video out there, you narrating the story, some footage on photos and some film footage or video footage, and you just do it at a one up level, we can get that disseminated. Well, uh, sure. We already, Peter, you might not remember this, but it's a, it's a while ago, but I did an interview with you when we were doing a beach cleanup with the beach co-op ages ago during Plastic Free July. So we have some footage of you collecting plastic from the beaches <laughs> of Cape Town. We can start with that. That was, that was quite beautifully shot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <love laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we do have quite a lot of stock footage we could probably get from Otto Whitehead, who works mm. with Tom Peshak. Um, mm. And Otto has done a year on Marion, so he's a big, you know, sort of he would happily donate footage, I'm sure. And he's an absolutely wonderful cinematographer. He just takes yes. beautiful. I know stuff. Otto well. We've 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 worked together before. So, oh, he's Otto, such a lovely great guy. guy. Oh, great, yeah. great, great, great yeah. guy. Great guy. That's a good idea. That's actually a brilliant idea. Um, <laughs> Rob, Rob Simmons. Yes. Uh, Rob Simmons wants to comment. Yeah. Oh, somebody Sorry, just Rob, muted unmute, Just unmute yourself again, please. Sorry, Rob. You clearly didn't want to hear from me, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, um, we, we still want to see you. Why would you say? We want to see you. I'm sure I have a photo of you somewhere, no, Rob. My, I'm not going to show them what you got. It says my bandwidth is very low, so I'm not going to put myself on video, just so Peter can hear, hear my question. Um, Peter, when do you know you've been successful uh, on Marion? In other words, you know, are you saying Wanderers are, are back to their, their, their pre-mouse and pre-cat levels? Um, are, are there any species which have become extinct uh, as a result of, of cats uh, and then mice on, on Marion and, and, and other islands for that matter. When do you say you've been successful? We talk about getting rid of the bloody mice and that's got to have an effect because we're, we're trying to measure it in terms of the birds coming back. When do you know you've been successful? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I guess the, in, in the case of the cat eradication, um, you know, we were a little disappointed that the, the birds haven't come back as quickly as we'd hoped. Um, and we attribute some of that to the mice, but we've we've seen common diving petrels come back in the last five years or so. Um, we've got greyback storm petrels breeding back on the island, so we are seeing benefits from the cat eradication. Um, you yeah. know, the, the the thing with seabirds is the the response is is somewhat muted. Um, uh, it depends whether you are growing just through dodgeless reproduction or whether you've got immigration um hopefully with yeah. prince edward next door we would get immigration and so we would get fairly fast recovery but you know the, the simple answer to when do you know whether you've been successful is when there are no mice on the island and then the island will look after itself and whether it will find exactly the same level that it was before mice were introduced is is impossible to say because we don't know what the island was like before mice were introduced. And it's gonna be a different world by then. You know, We're in a world of unprecedented global change, but at least the island will have a fighting chance to find a new level that will allow those populations to persist, perhaps not exactly as they were, but they'll, they'll be a lot healthier than if mice were on the island. And presumably you will have a few fit students uh, in measuring that as, as you go, as one goes along. That, that has historically been a, one of the weaknesses of, of the eradication kind of thing. People have tended to eradicate and then move on to the next project. There's, mm. there's always another project. Um, and so Mike Brook um, from uh, Cambridge uh, wrote a paper a few years ago, basically um, saying that, that we've really kind of dropped the ball a bit by not doing sufficient post eradication monitoring and mm. pulling together all of the little scraps of information on how populations have recovered. Um, so there is there is quite a nice overview paper by Mike Brook to look at. But uh, certainly in the case of Marion, we, we're in a fortunate position that we have a long history of, of intensive research of not only the birds, but also the terrestrial uh, vegetation and invertebrate populations on the island. So mm -hmm. we will be able to get some really good information going forward once the mice are gone. Let's be positive. <laughs> 